This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. This year, 2019 is the 400th year since many things happened in the Commonwealth of Virginia and there's different activities going on and before 2018 ended there was a resolution drafted to have this year be the year of reconciliation particularly as it relates to the the first slaves being brought into Virginia in 1619 I um, have as my guest Harrison Seaborn, who's a recent JMU communications graduate, and he and I attended an event last night uh, here in the early part of April at Virginia Union University that was entitled Truth and Reconciliation. And in fact, Harrison uh, recorded it that we could take a look at it later and perhaps put it up on a website. So we appreciate having someone of your generation here to talk some about and give some of your reflections about what you were hearing from the guests last night, uh, a descendant of Dred Scott and a descendant of the Chief Justice who was the, who wrote the opinion in the Dred Scott case. So uh, tell us some of your thoughts and reactions and reflections about last night. I really enjoyed the discussion last night uh, and yeah, sitting there listening to people who have such a connection to history and just the, the past of this country and the Commonwealth, it was really great to hear and they were really focused on forward thinking and the, the future of the state and the United States which was really cool to think about. It really got me thinking about how I interact with people and just like what I can do in my daily life to improve relations and just reconcile for the history of our state and our country. You know, it, was, it was really interesting to hear the great-great-granddaughter, I think I got enough greats in there, uh, <laughs> granddaughter of Dred Scott and talk about her interest going back about 20 years ago and just wondering to know more about her ancestor who, mm -hmm. was, who was from Virginia initially. The, the case that was, went to the Supreme Court ultimately was from Missouri. But um, and and then her thinking it'd be nice to meet some descendant of the chief justice and his family, and then the how that all took place really by a play uh, a one act play being written by the daughter of the man that we saw last night, who was uh, maybe the great great nephew uh, of the, of the chief justice. So it was it was very interesting to hear to hear how they got together and to, to hear their reconciliation. Yes, it was fascinating, the story. Um, so yes, the great, 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 great granddaughter, <laughs> I, hopefully that is yeah. enough, uh, the, of Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote a play in which the characters, one, one character, it's a fictional play, but one character is a descendant of Dred Scott and another is a descendant of Chief Justice Taney and they meet and have a discussion. And this kind of got the ball rolling on the two families meeting and the ultimate reconciliation between the two families, which I think is really, really great and super powerful. It, it is, and I, I started our conversation talking about the resolution that was introduced, which some might think if they didn't really 
recognize it, that the resolution came about after the events here in Richmond of February 1 that kind of shook everything up yes. with the yeah. chief executive. But the resolution was drafted before that. It already passed uh, in the process of being passed. So it was not reconciliation as it relates to yearbook pictures and reactions to those. It was something that that in, in many regards was much more serious in my perspective yes. of what had happened uh, in, in 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. I made some notes of something that was said and, and wanted to get your reaction to this because Charles Taney said that reconciliation happens in three steps. And I think his quote was that the party that's committed the injury has to recognize the harm, express regret, and then ask for forgiveness. And I think that's an interesting way and a helpful way to, uh, to describe reconciliation because uh, it's, it's not just recognizing that a harm, but that's only the beginning part. Definitely, it, yeah. That's, and it can be the hardest part, but it is, it's true that's the, you have to start there and then just move forward. You can't just do one part of those three steps and expect things to get better because better, it's a process, really. And communication, I would say, is key in reconciliation and recognizing the emotions of the, the parties involved and really respecting other people's opinions and their stance on issues and things like that. It's really important to keep the conversation going back and forth and not just recognize or like, try to make it work and not go the full measure, I'd say. Charles Taney told about having a, a large photograph of the, his ancestor, the Chief Justice, uh, and perhaps in their dining room or somewhere in their, in their house, and there would be table conversations always, and there would be different perspectives in their family. Some were saying, well, you know, pointing to the portrait, he was the one that did that. We didn't do that. Why do we have to express any regret? It, was, it wasn't anything we did. And it was interesting how they kind of fleshed that out. That That's a common sentiment I feel like people have often. And it is it is true, but it's also kind of ignoring the history and the the results of, of time as it passes by. It's not just because ancestors did something doesn't mean you have no fault necessarily. You are still connected to that past. And it's important to recognize that and try to reconcile because these things carry on generation to generation. It doesn't just end as soon as people who were involved in a conflict uh, go away or pass away. So the, again, looking at those three steps that he talked, recognizing the harm and expressing regret. But then the tough part, I think, even as they described it, was the uh, asking for forgiveness. Yes. And they, they talked about the his his asking forgiveness for this great great granddaughter of Dred Scott. That, and that, that was super powerful to think about. Just like I'm sure it was tough, and they talked about that last night. How tough it probably was for both of them to even come to grips with the history of it all, and asking for forgiveness was probably hard. And really taking that that request to ask for forgiveness and taking it seriously is probably kind of tough too just because it's like wow this is really heavy stuff and really important conversations to be had for sure but I yeah I really appreciate that the efforts that they went through and just hearing them talk about their story it was like wow it made me think about conflicts I've had in life and just life in general and it's like really really awesome stuff. We're having this conversation the day after reconvene day here at the Capitol yes, and yes. the event was that night and by the House and the Senate going uh, typically a little longer than they usually do on most days. It wasn't possible for legislators to get there. But the event was organized by a group, uh, Virginians for Reconciliation, which is the group uh, that, that got the resolution introduced and then the resolution passed. And from every indication of what we were hearing last night, this is just the the, the first probably of many events that they will be trying to conduct around the Commonwealth. That's awesome. That's exciting, definitely. I, yeah, more events would be great. Uh, just keep the conversation going, and uh, it's a process. And I really enjoyed hearing what people had to say last night. And the more perspectives, the better, I would say, in these issues, just to really, it really opens your mind. You know, the, as, we, as we would wrap it up and get any, any concluding thoughts that you might have, some of mine were that, that uh, Charles Taney talked about an initiative that he started sort of on his own in dealing with this called Breaking Bread, in which he was working to get people with, with diverse racial backgrounds together for, for a meal. 
And he talked about being in Connecticut, and when he wanted to do this, he realized he didn't know someone that he could invite. And, and that, that was kind of surprising to me, but not, not shocking, because so many times uh, where we live, and, and occasionally even where people work, they're working uh, only with a, a certain group of people, ethnic, religious, racial backgrounds, and, and, and they don't know other people. Definitely, I actually discussed that uh, that moment with a friend last night after we left the the meeting because it really it was a really strong moment, and I was like, "Wow, he just yeah admitted that yeah he didn't really have any connections to a family, and he wanted to break that bread, but he didn't really know where to go to even start that process." And yeah, it really made me think like, "Oh, wow, I yeah, there's people I should reach out to," and it just like it was it was yeah an interesting moment for sure, and I really appreciate that he had the courage to say that even it was yeah I really liked it. Yeah. Well, appreciate having you on. We could have had someone my age or near my age on, but I think really interesting to hear the perspective of someone, a recent college graduate, and your, your reflections. And for people who want to know more about the organization, they can go to the website. We're putting it up on the screen. But apart from the organization, I think the challenge last night was do what it is, whatever it is you need to do. You don't have to follow somebody else's program, but do whatever would be helpful in your case if you think that there's some need for reconciliation to, to work on that individually. Definitely, yeah, looking inward and really thinking about how, how you're interacting with people and yeah, thinking, what can I do to try to break these barriers down? I think it's really important for all of us. Definitely. Harrison, thank you for being on this week in Richmond very much. Definitely. appreciate Glad to be your here. being on. Yeah. And tell our viewers to wait just a moment, and they'll be hearing from the governor's chief workforce development person talking about what's happening in workforce in the Commonwealth. Delighted to welcome back, it's been a long time, Megan Healy, the Governor's Chief Workforce Development Advisor, to talk about something of this, this what's happening this year in the session and now the spring has finally come and what will be going forward. But we're having the conversation the day after the reconvene day, so we, now we know what legislation has passed. And going on the LIS system and just keying in workforce, mm -hmm. you just get bill after bill after bill, yeah. and a lot of them now say chapter that they are <laughs> in the code. So you start with uh, any one of those, and I've got some notes about others that I'll ask you about too. Great, yes, we had um, a great year of workforce. We know that a lot of people are excited, both sides of the aisle, about workforce. We've done polls out in the field with the governor and a lot of other people running for election of polls, and workforce is really coming to the top. Yes. It's a huge need. Um, you know, when I took my position, it was really about working with people with barriers to employment, um, but now it's really about helping businesses, because we have more jobs posted oh, than excellent. people that can fill them, and so we're really getting a strong signal from the business community. We need workers and they're even more likely to kind of help and support the workforce system that we've never seen before. So it's kind of an exciting time. Um, so some of our legislation that we worked on this year uh, that was really successful is really thinking about what partnerships look like and making sure that our workforce is business driven. Uh, one of our bills, thanks to Delegate James um, Carey, was around apprenticeships. So we hear mm -hmm. businesses over yes. and over again that say, you know, I would love to do apprenticeships, but I only can take three apprentices, but then now I need some type of classroom instruction that goes along with registered apprentice, uh, apprenticeships. And so what we um, helped support Delegate James on a bill was that the community college would provide uh, related instruction to high demand apprenticeships. And so, and it would be online or face-to-face -face or in blended formats. So we have, um, if a business in Southwest Virginia wants three apprentices and they that apprentice can actually go online and get the related instruction that's required for registered apprenticeships to finish out their apprenticeships. Oh, that, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And in case our viewers didn't know, it's great to have the governor has someone who was vice chancellor of the community college system. It had been a 
professor and teacher yes. also, so you knew that side of it. So that that's yes. a, that's worked well. Exactly, and the business community is really what brought that issue to us. Um, you know, we have a great apprenticeships in Roanoke, but since they're so great, people drive two hours uh, to go to work on the sites, and they have drive two hours home, so they just didn't have time to sit in a classroom for additional. So um, that was really great, and we had a lot of other businesses who really supported that bill. Um, one of the things we are looking for looking at is what's the future of work. Uh, so I think. In 10 years, jobs are going to change. Um, we have this gig economy, 1099, more part-time or independent contractors. And so we're looking at what is the landscape of those particular jobs in Virginia. And so one of the bills that we put forth, uh, supportive of the Aspen's too, that we're working with, Senator Mark Warner's office is also, he's a big uh, fan yes. of gig economy and future work, is that we looked at one of our current tax credits for retraining. Um, and then we basically, so a worker training tax credit that Delegate Byron uh, put forth, and it really looked at how do we better support businesses that want to continue training, um, as well as these tax credits, the lower income, the lower pay of a person who works there, the employee, uh, the higher the tax credit. And so it's really thinking about how do we upskill our current workforce, but how do we also support companies that might have the gig economy that they can also support with education and training. So some of our viewers who are maybe just hearing about this, mm -hmm. that they're yeah. maybe not as actively involved in their chambers as they could have been. Mm -hmm. um, does the tax credit help defray a certain portion then of, of what they, uh, the salary that would be paid or the, or the wages or the 1099 or? Um, really what it does is it pays, the tax credit pays the money that the employer invested in the training. Oh, excellent. So back pay, so if they send, um, if it, they send an employee to be upskilled or current, if it's a part-time or full-time, to go get some type of training, if it's through a community college or one of our great uh, proprietary schools or training academies, that then they get a tax credit up to a certain amount on the training that they spent. Now, I noticed something else, too, about a, a credential grant fund and program um, that, that was successful. Mm -hmm. now, that's a little different from the tax credit, but mm -hmm. how does that work? They actually go hand in hand, uh, surprisingly, when we think about the future of work. Um, so we have our Workforce Credential Grant that came out a couple years ago. It was huge support from the General Assembly, and every year we've kind of bumped up because they've showed um, with a lot of the research that the it's more of an, I would say, they call them like swirling adult. It's been this uh, short-term training that's funded uh, through the state. Two-thirds of the funding for this particular training is, uh, comes from the state, and one-third comes from the, the student that enters into it. And so with this workforce credential grant that we've been working on, also called Fast Forward at the community college system, um, it's been really, really helpful to get people within six to 12 weeks uh, quick turn turnaround training to get into these jobs in high demand, or it's also used to upskill. So the training that we provide had to come from a hot, uh, like a hot occupation list that we have that the Workforce Board, Virginia Board of Workforce, actually approves this list, and then the community colleges provide the training. And really how it works is that the student pays the first third, and when they complete the class, the state pays the second third, and then when that student completes a certification, uh, which is recognized by the industry, then the state pays the third third. So oh. we've added, the governor on his budget added four more million dollars to that pot so we can have more students go through that program. Yeah, I know you got some of your start in Danville, Martinsville, that part mm -hmm. of the Commonwealth. Uh, so let me ask you for the really underserved uh, or mm -hmm. areas of the Commonwealth, are, are those community colleges get geared up too so they'll be able to do that? I think we're, we're having a conversation yeah. in Richmond and you would think mm -hmm. that certainly the two major community colleges here would have it and mm -hmm. others, but is that pretty much system-wide that they'd be able to hopefully get this? That's actually, uh, that's an excellent question. We actually, this, the Workforce Credential Grant has actually been more popular in rural areas than urban areas. Oh, it is? Yeah, excellent. so, yeah, so, there, you know, there's a connection to the businesses that are looking for that entry-level training, and then the community colleges are better aligned to provide it because they have additional funds. And so we actually see more and more students from the rural areas. 
um, actually get these credentials versus the urban areas. We still have some, um, like Northern Virginia, many of, because of government contracting and what the work, landscape of work looks like, a lot of people still need bachelor's degrees up there. So they're still looking at ways to, to have um, more affordable pathways, but many to the bachelor's degrees. We're trying to change that because we still have plenty of, of uh, jobs out there that do not require a bachelor's degree. But in the areas, especially the rural areas, when that's not, bachelor's degree is not required, it's, it's specific skills if it's in advanced manufacturing or other kind of uh, industries, we've seen more and more popularity actually in those areas. I would think that your work certainly goes hand in hand with what Secretary Ball and others are doing mm -hmm. in economic development mm -hmm. because in trying to, to locate a business in a certain area, mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have the, the workforce ready, uh, to be able to do a quick turnaround as you're talking about and getting people ready, mm -hmm. Uh, where there's high unemployment already, uh, sounds like a real win-win. Yes, no, it's a great point. I mean, I work very closely with Secretary Ball, uh, actually all the secretaries, if it's with even health and human uh, resources, social services, right? Because we want to support yes. people that are on different social services to make sure that we can get them jobs. Um, we have work with DMAS for anyone who's on Medicaid, try to get them jobs, really to, to build those skill sets. But then with economic development, that's the number one thing businesses are looking for. Uh, they already have done their research before they enter it, usually an area, and it's really just just confirming that we have the talented workforce for them. You know, one of the other successful legislation that I spotted was something about local workforce development boards. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that fit into the whole puzzle as, a, as a, perhaps a significant piece? Mm -hmm. So in Virginia, we have 15 local workforce boards, and um, what they do is we actually have around 62 career work centers that we have our workforce centers, and some are very comprehensive, so they have job services like employment services that would include uh, interview skills, resume building, job search. We have uh, a technology that supports that, but then we also have training and education providers if it's from adult basic ed, which is for anyone that does not have a high school diploma. and so. And then we also have uh, from Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, so anyone with people with disabilities, and a disability can be um, intellectual, cognitive, physical disability, but it also could be someone who can't pass a drug test to get a job, and so on the behavior health side. And so we have these comprehensive, veterans is another at many of our, our places, right. so we have these comprehensive workforce centers that our workforce directors oversee. Um, part of the federal funding model that comes through the governor has oversight of federal workforce funds. One is really about education and training and the operation of these centers that fall under these 15 directors. I know it sounds complicated. It no, kind of no, is. It, it, <laughs> I'm glad you asked me this whole. last year because I might not have known on the answers <laughs> that I know now. Yes. Um, and so really that legislation was that we currently, we did a study this past year um, thanks to the Weldon Cooper Center that helped support support this study that to look at who's out of work. There was a national study done by Brookings Institute, so we wanted to replicate that in Virginia to see where the pockets are people out of work. With a un uh, low unemployment rate, it doesn't tell the whole story, specifically in rural Virginia. And so we found that there's 650,000 people that are jobless, so we could not find them. Um, wow. um, and we took out anyone who's retired early if they're in the military, mm -hmm. which we do have that in Virginia. We took out any parent that might stay at home that are in a household that does have um, a median wage. So if it's a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, they're not in the sample. We're not mm -hmm. considering them out of work. Mm -hmm. um, we took out any of that anyone who's currently on federal disability. Um, and so we found out there's 650,000 people. Oh, 650 after all of that. Yes, oh. yes. And so we broke it. We uh, sliced it with education level. It's amazing. 20% of them had bachelor's degrees. Um, but then we looked at the different regions as well. But when we look at youth, which that bill, basically after that study came out, uh, Delegate James Bill wanted to really look at opportunity youth and make sure that our workforce board directors really target that population. We have about 100,000 um, people in Virgi Virginians from 16 to age 24 that are not in school or not in a job. And so that legislation was there required at the region to really help this population. They get additional funds from the federal government too, but we that bill be added a little bit more structure to make sure they're really doing their job. Uh, one interesting thing I'm, I'm trying to piece together, because I think at the beginning of our conversation, I think I heard you say that there are jobs out there and you're trying to get 
people ready mm -hmm. for them. So are some of these 600,000 uh, just too far away, live too great a distance from where the jobs are or what? Uh, I'm not, not, that, not that people need to relocate, but mm -hmm. it sounds like that, that there are jobs some places waiting for people, mm -hmm. people at other places looking for a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much there's there's two things I would say are the skills and the supports that we lack. So one is the mismatch of skills. So we have these jobs that have specific skills and then we have people that might, and I consider them like on the sideline, right. who don't have the skills or know how to get those skills or where those opportunities are. And then we have, but then also the supports, right? So if you need to go get the skill and training or if you need to get that job, you might not have childcare. You might not be able to pay for childcare. Yes. You might not have a reliable transportation. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about the distance between the job and the person, it could be in rural areas, it's transportation. We know that life happens and many students drop out of school or um, trades or their job because they have a flat tire. And then, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have money to pay for that flat tire, so they can't figure out how to, to get to work. And so really, the workforce system is really, I always call it like skills and supports, because we can't just get the skills, we have to wrap supports around it. And that's why we partner with a lot of different organizations like social services and our others. Megan Healy, I wish we had more time, yeah. but thank you so much, and we want to have you back on. And okay. thank you for what you're thanks. doing on Workforce. Yeah, thank for thank you. Me. Thank you very much. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Uh -huh.